Hello and welcome to Visual Radio. Minel Suri is back. After five years, we interviewed Minel in Winthrop, Mass. And here we are in Winchester. And before the show begins, I'd like to say the views and opinions on Visual Radio are those of the host and his guest, and not necessarily those of Winchester Community Access and Media, its board of directors, staff, volunteers, and all our affiliate stations, Boston Neighborhood Network, Somerville, Cambridge, Stoneham, Bill Ricca, Brookline, Burlington, we're all over the place. That's great. Manhattan That's Neighborhood Network. Wow. Hello again. Indeed. Hello and congratulations on this big, uh, uh, you know, lots of new, new stations since I last saw you. Lots of new stations. We do a weekly show here, mm -hmm. but we do special events when very special people show up. And you're here. Oh, thank you. No, it, it's, it was a fun interview five years ago. Yes, and it's taken me that long. Actually, it took me 12 years to write this book because I'd already started this in September of 2000. That's fascinating to yes. me. Yes, uh, especially since I'm going to read you the opening scene. And you have to keep in mind that this was before 9-11 that I wrote this. Oh. So let me, should I start with oh, reading Oh, please, let's, we're okay. going to start with a reading. Okay, so this is the city of Davy. And um, I'll just start right at the beginning. Four days before the bomb that is supposed to obliterate Bombay and kill us all, I stand in the ruins of Crawford Market, haggling with a lone remaining fruit seller over the price of the pomegranate in my hand. Is 500 rupees not an outrageous price already? Why won't you sell it to me for 500? Look at what's happening around you, Mame Sahib. Do you think the orchards are overflowing with pomegranates? Do you think the lorries are driving into Mumbai every day and filling the markets with fruit? I'm only asking for a thousand because it's you, Mame Sahib, but even three times that much wouldn't be too much for this last piece, which really was the best one in the pile to begin with. I look at the sign for Crawford Market behind me still smoldering from last night's air raid, or has it simply been another terrorist bomb? All around are shops gutted in the fire, Remains of baskets lie scattered on the ground. Pieces of fruit too charred for the scavengers to steal rest at my feet. The fruit wala has a point. Supply and demand, he has me where he wants. This much I know, I must have the pomegranate before I begin my quest. Some instinct deep inside insists it's my best shot. But what's tied into the folds of the silk dupatta around my neck is a few hundred less than the fruit wala wants. But yeah, listen, I try once more. They're dropping the atom bomb this week. Atom bomb, you understand? Not some firecracker that's demolished the market around you. On Bombay, Mumbai, whatever you call it, the city's going to be finished. What would you do even if you did manage to squeeze out the extra money from someone? Take it to heaven with you? And what if nobody else came to your store? Most of the city has fled, you know. Is this what you want to happen to your fruit? I nudge the tangerine with my foot and it crumbles into ash. But the fruit wala is adamant, he won't sell for less. It's all up to Devi Ma's grace, he says. She's the city's patron goddess after all. Now that she's appeared in our midst, perhaps she'll save us, who knows? But even if she doesn't, even if she only lets me hold the money for 10 minutes, at least I'll have it for that much time. At least I'll die with an offering for her in my hand. Chilling. The thought of, um knowing in advance that a bomb would drop. So there was yeah. a threat? Yeah, there's a threat. Uh, Pakistan has said that no, October 19th, four days from now, we're going to drop a bomb. And the reason for that is that they're involved in this war with India. Uh, India has stronger conventional forces. And the thinking is, amongst military experts, that you know Pakistan just cannot meet those uh, same forces. And so they would have to use this nuclear threat somehow. But India has nuclear weapons as well. They both do, and uh, that's what's one of, it's one of the scariest uh, areas of the world. In fact, uh, especially with the instability in Pakistan, uh, having all these nuclear weapons, you know, it's a very scary thought. It's almost like the old um, United States and Russia, but at least U.S. and Russia knew the repercussions worldwide. Right. So I right. think they were more on their toes. Yes, and they had these panic buttons and everything, you know, the red, whatever, the red phone, the red yeah. line. But, and they're trying to set up similar things in India, but again, I think I, you know, India is going to be fine, but I just don't know what's happening in Pakistan. So that's, that was one of the, one of the things that um, you know, I came up with. The reason was really to create an atmosphere 
where uh, the opening sequence shows that this woman, Sarita, she's looking for a pomegranate because she's trying to find her husband, Karun, who has gone missing for about two weeks. And this pomegranate plays a role in the, f in the, in the book where it's somehow going to bring him back. That's what she assumes. Uh, but the whole nuclear scenario is to create this atmosphere where she's completely desperate. You know, if your life is going to end in four days, what are you going to do with those last four days? You're going to look for the people that you love and that you've lost. And that's what she does. I'd wondered why she uh, didn't use the money she had. Uh, and she had it, what, in her kerchief? Mm -hmm. Like her dupatta, yeah. Get on a train and get the heck out. There weren't any trains. Uh, and, and what had happened was um, her husband has gone for about two weeks and she's been sitting at home waiting for him to return. And that's what's stopping her from leaving with her parents and her sister. And, you know, she waits and waits and then he doesn't come and the time is ticking by. So she says, finally, I'm going to just go by myself. Even though the city has been divided into Hindu and Muslim areas, She's going to somehow try to negotiate these, you know, these gangs are marauding and everything around, and she has to somehow negotiate this and find her husband. We're talking about the city of Devi, or Devi, depending on linguistics, by Manil Suri. Hello, Manil. Hi. So um, I want to go off a little bit here. We're talking about the potential of a, uh, an atomic bomb dropping on Mumbai. This meteorite that fell over Russia. Ah. My roommate and I were at dinner last night, and I said, you know, there's a lot of space junk up there. Right. We don't know what they're doing with the space station. What if, since it's Russians up there with Americans, what if they just took 30 of these old satellites that don't work anymore, made them a meteor to see what they could do to another country? Mm. Just a little experiment. Don't give them ideas. I, I know. mean, we have enough things to worry about. Uh, one of the things that you know, I was writing about in this book was the cyber terrorism which uh, you know, when I started writing it, it wasn't really a big thing. In fact, uh, when we were looking at the copy for this book like a year and a half ago, uh, my editor said, let's just remove that. People don't know what that is. And then right after that, suddenly it was in the news everywhere. You know, cyber attack, this, that. Suddenly it seems to have come up. So, I mean, after your, um, your comments right now, we might start seeing, you know, satellite terrorism, meteorite terrorism, something like that. Well, I'm wondering if that's what it was. Oh, you think it was something I like think that? since we don't know what they're doing in the space station. So I think they come up with ideas. It's like, and we'll, mm. we'll do it in Russia since we're Russians. Right. And it's going to be so far high in the sky. Mm -hmm. But it's almost like a warning shot saying, look what we can do. James Bond, and, and I think your film, especially when your movie, uh, your book. My book. Not yet a movie, but let's hope. <laughs> See, it's, I'm psychic. I, I know that uh -huh. it's going to be a movie. Fate of the world sounds like James Bond. Right, right. No, absolutely. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's one of those scenarios that once I started looking into it, it became more and more fun in a way, but also more and more chilling. Uh, so I tried to kind of balance that with humor uh, mm. because you don't want to make it too grim and really scare people completely so that they just frozen solid. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that I liked about writing this book. You could really go in, make it kind of really fantastic, speculative, scary, but also with a Bollywood tinge to it. Now, in Bollywood, I have a good question here, but in Bollywood, uh, the Regent Theater in Arlington was playing a lot of Bollywood films, one of the few mm. theaters in the region, and they were doing right. very well. Uh -huh. So it, it'd be fascinating for someone who's not familiar with the whole concept. That's how I learned of Bollywood, because they were running them in Arlington, the next town. Yeah, I mean, the thing is that um, there's more and more theaters in the U.S. that show Bollywood films. Uh, where I live in Maryland, some of the regular cineplexes will suddenly start showing for a week some big hit that's just come. And um, what happens in the book is there is a movie called Super Devi, which is uh, a Bollywood film. It's sort of part slumdog millionaire, part Superman. It's about this uh, girl who you know, takes on powers of Devi to fight crime. So, so that becomes a big hit. Um, and, and I personally have been sort of, um, you know, grew up with Bollywood films, at least one film every, every week. And my father actually worked in the business, so oh. he, he was an assistant music director. And we used to go and see previews sometimes. Uh, so, so that was an essential part, not only of my upbringing, but 
the whole of India in some sense because it was the single strand that tied together all, all levels of society, you know, from beggars on the street to the most rich people. They all knew about Bollywood. And it's very American. It's interesting how certain things in the cultures blend mm -hmm. because people pick up, oh, this is a fun experience. Right. And then it becomes a whole world unto itself. Yes. Now, the main character, she talks, I think the husband came up with it, old wives' tales. Use that term. And the pomegranate, it's like, okay, you've got this scientific horror of an atomic bomb, mm -hmm. and you're delving into the world of superstition. Right. Is it like the last resort? It is sort of, you know, it's, uh, I, and I looked up uh, uh, pomegranate, aphrodisiac properties, and you can find things like that. Oh, I didn't know web. that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the, almost anything you can find things like that. But with a pomegranate, it has an Indian connection because uh, it's actually mentioned in the Kama Sutra as something that you can uh, take the seeds and kind of grind them up and use them to, to make this uh, very potent love potion or something like that. So anyway, uh, the main character, Sarita, is obviously not superstitious. She's a statistician, but she's so desperate that she's willing to give this a try. Uh, and of course, she's thinking that this pomegranate will hold the key to getting her husband back, tell her why he's left. And it does tell her that, but in a very different way. It's not what she thinks. It's not this ripe symbol of you know, lust and so on that, that, that it's presented as in the beginning. Isn't that the way life in this dimension kind of wor operates? You know, Edison might be looking for something, mm -hmm. find something else. In the search for one thing, they find another. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, you know, we were talking about um, the nuclear threats and all these other things. And I think the example that comes to my mind is uh, just the space program, uh, NASA and so on. Uh, so many things were invented as a result of the space program. Uh, you know, the space shuttle, uh, while they were trying to figure out the tiles that went around it, that material was then used in all sorts of applications, uh, civilian applications. So, so I think it's, it's that kind of thing that funds, that, I mean, the, the whole idea behind basic research is to come up with new inventions like that. And I should just point out that uh, Sarita's husband, Karun, is actually a researcher. He's a physicist. And he's looking at what, uh, what actually makes up all matter. Uh, he's looking at some, some of the fundamental questions of the origins of the universe. He's looking at quarks, which are the basic building blocks of all material, and come in three generations. And uh, this is sort of juxtaposed against his um, father, who believes that everything, you know, he's very superstitious, the father, and he thinks that everything is made up of these three Hindu deities, uh, Shiva, Vishnu, and Devi, the mother goddess. I find it fascinating where there are so many religions, and different people have different belief systems, and when they start converging, well, is it Buddha? Is it Jesus? Who, who is it that is, uh, it, it can't it, be all of them. Yeah, or it, is it just science? You know, that's, that's one of the fundamental questions here. Is it, is it really religion? Is, is that the best way? And it's a question of explaining the world. So is it the religious aspects that best explain the world for what you want? Or is it something you know, like quarks or atoms and molecules that actually make up a worldview that you can accept? And so that's, that's one of the fundamental questions that some of these characters also grapple with. Now, is the book out in India? It actually first came out in India. In fact, I just came back from India a few weeks back. And, uh, uh, it, it was released in Calcutta, and then I went to Bombay, and then Delhi, and then um, Jaipur, where they have this big literature festival now, which has become extremely popular. What's the city? Uh, the Jaipur. Jaipur. Yeah, in, in Rajasthan. So that's one of the big tourist cities. Uh, lots oh. of architecture and so on. And that's, they've made that every January, they have this uh, festival there. It started with about 5,000 attendees. Now there's about 50,000. So, and all the big names have come there. They've had Nobel Prize winners, and they have lots of literature, li literary figures come, and it's just fantastic. So were you there this year? I, I was, and it was, it was the second time I went. I went for the Age of Shiva as well, 
Um, and it's, you know, some of the things that they do are completely over the top. Uh, you know, there's stuff that I've written about in this book that's over the top, but if you want to see real stuff, go to the opening uh, kind of thing and they bring you to this palace and when you enter, you're taken in these antique cars through the, through the street. How and then cool. They're, they're these, they're these 200 uh, like, uh, people, 200, um, I guess you would call them, um, they're dressed up in costumes and they're holding torches. So they're lining your path. And then there, there's some more who are on horses. And then there's dancing girls and uh, lamps all over and fireworks and for it, a book festival for a book festival for the opening ceremony of a book festival. That is that is fascinating. In India, um, do you see the sales on Kindle and other Nook and these other web-based? Uh, do they compare to it's, the book sales? It's just starting. So uh, I think you still cannot get things in India itself. You have to order them from uh, outside the country. So you can download it, but the problem is you have to pay that in dollars. So people have to have that it's foreign very expensive. exchange. Yeah. And so, so, you can't, so it's not yet taken off, but it will, I think, uh, in the next few years. So you have really two huge markets, America and India. And well, India is uh, a huge market in terms of the number of people, but um, culturally, I think they're still kind of, um, I mean, it's growing, but when I was growing up, we never bought books. They were always considered too expensive. Now that's changing a little bit, but a bestseller is still about 5,000 copies, you know, or the whole country. And you have to remember, this is a country of a billion people, um, out of which probably, you know, at least 10% would speak English. Uh, so that's still a huge market. But, but the culture isn't one of buying books as yet. It's, it's increasing slowly. Are there libraries? There are libraries and there are circulating libraries. It's sort of like um, you pay for a book. So what you do is you rent a book out for a week and you pay a few you know, rupees for it and then you just turn it back in. So that's the way, that's the system over there. And we here in America collect. We collect and that's great. I mean, I think you know, one of the nice things about, that I liked about this book was the cover just because um, it's, I think what's happening is that um, publishers with the e-books that you're talking about, they're realizing that if they want to attract people to buy an actual hardcover, hardback, uh, they need to do something special. So for a while they were actually cheaping out on the books, they were using really not, not such good paper and all, but now they've started putting in a lot of money into the actual object and just to attract people from e-book sales. So that's why you see these very nice experiments with books now. You know about uh, vinyl recordings and how the record industry kind of pushed them out the door mm -hmm. to bring CDs in. Right. And now the record industry is enamored of downloading. Right. There's no manufacturing, no transportation, yes. no really not even publicity like mm -hmm. there was. They used to have offices right here in Winchester for ah, Warner Brothers. Wow. Now they have them work out of their home. And what are they really promoting? They go to the radio stations. It's so automatic. Mm -hmm. The industry does not exist, but the vinyl's coming back with high grade 20 gram vinyl or something and it's like oh. $20 for an album. Wow. For an, you know you can get Abbey Road by the Beatles mm -hmm. or Queen or The Doors or major rock acts right. and some classical acts on the vinyl. So vinyl is coming back in England, coming back in, in America. In a limited way, but, but people are buying turntables. I got a turntable for Christmas. Wow, that's pretty neat. I mean, I grew up with turntables, not just a turntable, but a gramophone where you had to wind it up by hand. And you could only uh, play 78 RPM on that. Whoa. And so uh, what, I think by the time I was, I don't know, 10 or something, the 78s had gone out, out. So you couldn't find them anymore. So I just had a limited collection of records and I would play them. and. Um, I, you know, I had something called House of Bamboo. That was one of my favorites, and I even used it in the previous book. Uh, just had a line from that. The faster the record turns on the turntable, I believe, the better the sound quality. Oh, really? Huh. I didn't know that. Yeah, because when you record, mm -hmm. they used to record on the analog tape. They'd be two inches and 30 inches per second, so you're splashing all that sound there, whereas a cassette's only almost two inches right. per second, so they're condensing all that sound Sure. onto a tiny little cassette and it wasn't as high quality. Mm -hmm. The faster something moves, the, the vibrations. I'm not, I'm not a physicist or a statistician. Um, yeah, but well, well, I'm a mathematician, but I don't know about that. And, and as an author, 
Uh, um, so I agree with you. Now the colors are almost misleading for the book because it's so colorful and the book has many dark elements. Uh, I think it's just beautiful what they did with the colors. Yeah, I think so. Uh, it's, it's just, you know, this is Chip Kidd, who is a very good designer, and he's the one who came up with this. Uh, interestingly enough, they didn't like this cover in uh, India. They, they thought it was too Bollywood and, you know, it just got too much for them. Plus, they didn't get the mask thing because masks are not so common in India. So, like, when you see this in this country, you think of Superwoman or Supergirl or something like that. Which was my next question. Is Sarita somehow the Super Divi? Well, um, yes and no. I mean, she is uh, one. I mean, there's a lot of um, sort of correspondences with uh, the characters and sort of deities. Uh, you know, there's a central triangle that's formed by uh, Karun, Sarita, and the third character, Jazz, that I guess we'll talk about a little later. Uh, and, and those three characters, there's not a one-to-one -one kind of correspondence, but there is the central uh, Trinity in Hinduism of uh, Shiva, Vishnu, and Devi. So, you know, there's that metaphor that you see there. This number three kept appearing in this book. All three of your books cover all three of the gods. That's right, yeah. Um, last night I interviewed a woman on a show we have called Music Closet, and I told her about my dream. <laughs> and you know how intimate dreams are. Mm -hmm. But I woke up yesterday morning. And in the morning, I had had a dream about I was walking into a uh, restaurant, and I don't drink because I'm always driving. Okay. So I, you know, I'd rather have tea, and I'm happier with tea. But I go into this bar, and the woman behind the counter, it looked like an Applebee's. She serves me a glass of beer, a can of beer, and a bottle of beer. Huh. And the glass spilled over like a quarter of it or a third of it onto the floor. So there's your three. Right. Maybe it was a premonition that I was going to uh -huh. be interviewing Manil Suri today, right. which I already knew. Uh -huh. right, right. But maybe the super brain tells you, okay, yeah. I don't know. Well, I mean, since we are talking about Super Davy, should I read out uh, the second I would part? love you to read about okay. Super Davy. Let me, let me uh, jump right into that. Um, and this is, this is the, well, I guess it'll be self-explanatory. Well, let me ask before you do it. Sure. Because um, we had the, the problem in Libya mm -hmm. about the YouTube video. Right. Does the movie have any way provoke people? Super In TV? the book it does. Yeah. Uh, because what happens is that on the surface it is a, uh, you know, it's a Bollywood film. But then it's also used by right-wing fundamentalists, politicians, to foment this idea in the rural areas that the Super Devi wants to rid the country of all minorities. And so that's how things really get bad. Uh, and that's, you know, that's, I mean, I'm basically blaming Bollywood for the end of the world. So that's, that's what, what's going to happen, according to my prediction. And so you anticipated this prior, way prior to Libya. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, this is, and there are other things, too, that sort of, um, sort of after I wrote about them, they started to come true, which is very scary. There's a whole scene about, politicians in India using Twitter to, to again, get their oh. followers, you know, uh, to do things uh, like to foment, again, religious intolerance. And that's what happened last year in India where there was this big Twitter scare uh, and people from, uh, from a certain community were terrorized by politicians using Twitter. So that was, you know, again, my God, I, it's just strange how some of these things resonate with what happens later on in life. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, so let me read that yes. section. Manel is going to read from the new book, The City of Devi, or The City of Devi, and this is about the Super Devi yes. the movie. Yes, right. Super Devi released that summer, deluging even non-movie people like us with its hype. The most expensive Indian film ever made, thanks to the backing of both Hollywood and the Indian Mafia. Lata M teams up for her techno comeback with Lady Gaga, who Uma said was a famous pop star. Their title duet rockets to the top of charts worldwide. And up in the sky, a bird, a jet, no, Super Devi herself, zooming overhead behind a prop plane as we sat and tried to ignore her on the beach at Chapati. Supposedly, the script borrowed extensively from Slumdog Millionaire and Superman, 
films which neither of us had seen, in telling the story of a young girl from the Mumbai slums with the power to assume different avatars of Devi to fight crime. Uma kept herding us to McDonald's, which was giving away all nine incarnations from the movie as collectible action figures throughout India and parts of England and New Jersey, free with food purchases, vegetarian only so as not to upset Hindu sentiments. She collected eight of the figures, turning off the light at home to show us how they glowed in the dark just like Super Devi. Despite foisting dozens of Makalu Tikki sandwiches on us, and I'll interrupt and say, McDonald's in India, go for the Makalu Tikki sandwiches. They're amazing. I never eat at McDonald's here, but those are really spicy. Vegetarian? Those, vegetarian, delicious. So despite foisting dozens of Makalu Tikki sandwiches on us, however, she never managed to acquire the elusive Kali incarnation, toting her AK-47 from the final battle scene. The movie managed to surpass even the most optimistic projections. I read breathless reports in magazines of kids dragging their families to see it three and four and even ten times, of the urban youth of India finding spiritual enlightenment in Super Devi's incarnation as call center worker to fight telefraud, of Desis in New York and London and Sydney bringing such gaggles of white friends to screenings that the film quickly spilled over to mainstream international release. A ZTV program documented how Super Devi wielded its greatest power over rural India, whose citizens experienced it not as movie, but as religious odyssey, calling the heroine Upar Devi, which translated to Upper Devi in several Indian languages. The reporter followed scores of villages, villagers making pilgrimages from miles around to get the Super Devi's blessing at a small theater in Ambala where both fire exits had been converted into Devi shrines for patrons to leave flowers, coconuts, and monetary offerings. Perhaps the most definitive evidence of the film's popularity appeared in the calendar art sold on city streets. All the goddesses from Lakshmi to Saraswati to Parvati bore striking resemblance to Super Devi's child heroine, Baby Rinky. Superman is uh, kind of like religion light. And I don't think people get that, that this is Jesus in a cape. Oh, I never got that. That's, that's very interesting. Of course, that he has all these powers. He can okay. go back in time. He uh -huh. can, you know. Right, uh, right. St. Peter says in the Bible, um, when Jesus asks him a question, Lord, you know everything mm -hmm. already. Right, right. And, and, and that makes me think, oh, that's right. Jesus knows everything. He's, mm -hmm. you know, eternal. Uh, so Superman to me and, and, and all these um, heroes, people need a hero. And of course, the, uh, the what, St. John's Bible was written, what, 80 years after hmm. the event? Well, he was in his 80s. Okay. So it was about 50 years after the events. If I didn't have this on tape, my version of talking to you might change tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Right, sure. So 50 years after Jesus walked. Absolutely. It, it, you know, um, so Super Davy, why England and New Jersey? I mean, that's funny. Well, that's because there's so many Indians there. You oh. know? So there's so many Indian immigrants, especially in New Jersey. Oh. So that's the joke there, that it's so <laughs> crawling with Indians that, you know, that's... Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah. I found it funny, even though I didn't know okay, that. Okay, okay, okay. Because it's kind of right. like picking two territories. Right, right. right. It's, it's interesting because there's this whole culture of Bollywood that uh, I guess about even 10, 15 years ago, it, it was not really there. People didn't identify with it or know much about it. But now it's, uh, it's sort of melding into Hollywood, you know, especially with Slumdog Millionaire. I think that movie ended with this dance at the end. And that's what I want you to think about when you're reading this book, because parts of it are kind of like fantasy-like. Um, and, and the way that happened was that at some point in this book, I had to give it up. I just was completely stuck. Um, I was trying to figure out what the plot should be. And I kept getting, you know, nothing was working. And I finally figured out that the reason for that was, being, was that I was imposing too many constraints on myself. I was being too literary. I was thinking, okay, this is a literary novel. We must be serious. We must you know, adhere to these realistic expectations and things like that. And it was only when I decided that I need to break free of all that. If, if the plot calls for elephants coming to the rescue, fine, do that. You know, and trains going off the tracks and all that. So when I did that, when I took that step, I sort of entered 
into this uncharted for me territory. You know, it's part Bollywood, part thriller, part fantasy, and it still has that literary uh, thing going on underneath. And that's when, that's when this book really, I think, takes, takes shape in some sense and breaks free. So, so that was a very interesting thing that I learned while, while writing this book. Has Hollywood or the British film industry been able to put together a film for India that represents it accurately outside of Bollywood? Hmm. Well, uh, I think uh, there was a movie called uh, The Chess Players, uh, which I think won the best uh, foreign film award, perhaps. Uh, or I can't remember if it did or didn't. But that was by this famous uh, film director, Satyajit Ray. Uh, he wasn't Hollywood or British, but he was Bengali. So he's not in Bollywood. He's in a different mm -hmm. state in India. And he's considered one of the greatest film directors from India, but not Bollywood. So he's not escapist. He's not entertainment oriented. And that was a period piece, a historical pre piece about the uh, British in India. And that was fantastic. And I think that you know, in terms of serious cinema, that comes close to capturing at least India from that previous time. Did you have any uh, repercussions from covering the gods? Actually, I haven't. And I think the reason for that is that um, I mean, there's nothing really objectionable in, um, in any of my books. I think the first book in particular, um, it really, you know, I was discovering mythology myself and Hinduism, you know, the tenets from the Bhagavad Gita myself. So I was very anxious to actually explain them myself. I was just enthralled by them. So the first book actually goes pretty deep into that and just talks about it, about Hinduism, what it stands for. Um, the second book really has much less to do with, uh, with, with any kind of deities. It has one central myth about Shiva's spouse Parvati and her attachment to her son. And that's played out in real life. And I think what, what happens with all these myths is that Human beings are constantly aspiring to be like the gods, but you know, we're all imperfect, so we can never match up to it. And so that's where the failing lies. And again, in this book, I think the only mythology you need to know is that um, the mother goddess, she appears in all sorts of different forms. She's the creator, she's the destroyer, she's everything in between. She's also the patron goddess of Mumbai. This, ah. which is the city of Devi. Right. Mumbai actually means mother. Mumbai and I both mean mother. And so, oops. so, so actually, uh, Mumbai is, uh, Mumbai Devi is the city of Devi, is, is the patron goddess of, Mum, of, uh, of the city. So the death of Vishnu was the first book? That's right. And what year was that? That was 2001. So 2001, okay, and then 2008 we met. That's right, and this on is the, 2013. The Shiva. Yes. So you have a long time, and your books, uh, I mean, you know, this is, uh, it's fun reading. As far as I've gotten, I have not completed the book yet, of course. You can probably tell from my questions. But um, it's about 381 pages. Well, I can do better than that. I can give you a much better breakdown into, if you're looking at numbers, because the first book, um, I actually did a calculation. It took me five years to write that. And I did a calculation. I looked at the number of words uh, per day that actually made it to the printed page. And that was something like 49.6. Not very good. Whoa. The second book took seven years to write. And uh, for that, the average was about 64.6. You're getting better. So much better. And now, <laughs> and now for this book, how much do you think it'll be? 120. No, it's 69.4. So I'm getting better, but I seem to be leveling off. So I think I'm, I'm kind of plateauing. So uh, I don't think it's going to be much faster than this. You're a mathematician? That's right, yes. Your book is far more creative to me than a, a mathematician would write. Although one has to say that mathematics is also creative, so. Uh. Yes, but I think, in, and this is me thinking in terms of black and white, of course, I don't mm -hmm. always think of the general whole. Um, I'm generalizing, of course, but I, I see like when I'm in a recording studio, the engineers are very mathematician and the producers are more creative and the colorful people. And sometimes there's the battle because the engineer wants to be the producer. Uh -huh. And uh, producers have problems unless they find an engineer willing to play that role. And so I see that also with, uh, you could be creative in math, but can it translate to the written word? It's a whole different dimension. Well, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the unusual things of um, actually, 
I, th I think a lot of mathematicians do creative things other than math. Uh, what's unusual in this case is that my hobby actually ended up getting published. And it, it ended up, you know, I'm sitting here talking about my book. Um, after my first book came out, two of the professors in my, my colleagues uh, confessed to me that they were actors in secret. Ah. Uh, you know, and one of them <laughs> even wanted a part in the movie if it was ever made. So, uh, so I think all of us have these different facets. And uh, society kind of tells us to do just one thing. Yes. But, uh, you know, every, people, people do other things. They might keep it secret. They might not get the same amount of success. But, you know, it's good to see that we all have this inside us. Hey, the animated graphics behind us, they, they're so animated. Uh -huh. They, they want to be something else, but they, they can't. They're stuck in their mathematical equation. Right, yeah, I guess so. Um, and one of the, one of the things that, that, you know, this, this idea of wanting to be something else or be someone else, I think that's one of the, um, we, we haven't talked about the other two characters, Karun and Jazz. And Karun in particular is uh, someone who's, he's the physicist, but uh, he's, his wife, I mean, they've been married for two years and their, their marriage has never been consummated. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that she really has to find out what's been going on. And uh, just to dwell on the third character, Jazz, he's sort of the most out there character and maybe the character that I've enjoyed the most in terms of writing through all three books. And uh, Jazz is, uh, is gay and he's a Muslim. And so that's a strange juxtaposition. His parents have grown up all over, the, have taken him all over the world. So, you know, they're Muslim scholars. Kind of like a gay football player. Sort of. And, but, but, you know, this thing has really um, kind of, I mean, his childhood has been very disjointed and he's had all sorts of emotional problems. And he finally discovers what the real root of all this is, and that's his sexuality. Once he discovers that, he really breaks free, he bursts out, and he becomes this very irreverent, wisecracking character. And he was great fun to write. Uh, and one of the questions that I had was how honest to be, you know, writing him. Should I really go all out and show him in his true form? And that's what I did. Uh, and of course, I was telling you I went to Calcutta originally, and one of the things I was told is, okay, whatever you do, don't read out any of the jazz sections. Uh, they'll be scandalized. And uh, so naturally, that's exactly what I did. Well, that's I the racy on. stuff you that's were talking about. That's the racy stuff. And, and you know what? They, they were fine. No one fainted. Uh, the city seems to have survived. So, uh, so I think people are changing as well. They are. They are. And as new generations come up, they're acclimated to things that they can't believe people were horrified by. I mean, we can't even imagine slavery in America now. Mm -hmm. um, right. But it was just a commonplace. So it's how children are brought up and see what's around them in their world. Mm -hmm. You know, um, my animated graphics here, if we could have the center camera, um, that circle thinks it's the super Devi hearing okay. us talk. And once I, it, they talk to me as we, uh -huh. okay. I have, these are my <laughs> right, voices right, in right. my head. Right. But, um, Th that's fascinating that you've gotten these, these three different books, and you must get all sorts of commentary now on the first two as you're traveling around. Um, not so much. I mean, it's, uh, I, mean I, I, I have a Facebook page, and I think that that's a good way of readers to actually get back uh, and, and ask me questions about all three books. And so that's been very good because, uh, you know, of course, you answer the same questions in some sense uh, uh -huh. over and over again, but it's great to be able to communicate that way. I'm not so sure about uh, social media as such. Twitter, uh, Tumblr, been, Yeah, I've been MySpace. doing Twitter as well and just starting on that. And that's, that's good, but I think I'm more a Facebook page, uh, Facebook type person. Um, but what I'm really fascinated by, and you've, you've been talking about animation, I've been um, giving my book talks with a PowerPoint presentation. Ah. And I've got these little animations that, you know, I've, I've, I've done this a lot for my math stuff to make it more accessible. So I've brought it into the book things too. And, and that's been going very well. I have sound effects, I have uh, little cartoonish animations, and you know, and then I read from it. So it's a, like a multi multimedia pre presentation. I haven't heard of book authors using PowerPoint. That's fascinating. Uh -huh. And um, we're coming towards the end of our show, I'm sure. Um, we've got five minutes left. Where is the tour taking you this time in 2013? Well, um, I'm in India for one, and then after that I'm uh, going, I did New York, and then New England, and then the West Coast, 
and then I'll be going to England for, for a week. And so, so, you know, that, and then there's some smaller things that'll continue, but. I think it's May 30th. Is that the New York Book Festival? There's some big f festival at the end of May, early June, I think, in New York. Uh, I'm not aware of it. Festival so. of Books. We uh -huh. were just looking it up uh -huh. the other day. Um, so th that might be a fun thing as well. What other countries have the new book? Uh, right now, it's just France. So uh, I think uh, with the economy the way it is, publishers are really uh, waiting to see that the book breaks out of the pack uh, before they'll commit to anything. So I'm expecting that if things go well, uh, the Frankfurt Book Fair is still, you know, that's usually in September, October. I don't know about it. Yeah, oh. that's, that's the big kind of market. So, so the year after a book comes out, uh, it, it's very crucial how it does during the year so that in October, then you can figure out if you're gonna get foreign sales or not. Do you have uh, the French copy now in the? No, it's, it's not yet translated. Uh, the previous book actually did very well in France. Uh, it was called Mother India over there. And I went to Interesting France. Interesting name. Yes, and uh, that's the name of a famous Bollywood movie too. Oh. So uh, I went there, my French editor is actually Indian. Uh, she speaks oh, French, good, so, good, so good. she's she's wonderful. I just met her at Jaipur, uh, so it's it's you know it's it's the world is sort of all coming together in a way. Can you read French? I can read a little bit, but not enough to actually speak it there. Yeah, uh, because you want to make sure your book doesn't go into wild directions that you never intended. Yeah, well, luckily, um, you know, there's a very good translator, and then my editor also looks it over. Um, and I guess that's one of the things with any kind of translation. Uh, you never quite know what, uh, what you've actually ended up with. Uh, I remember my first story ever was translated into Bulgarian. And they sent me a copy of the journal and I couldn't even find my story because it was all in that Cyrillic type alphabet. So I don't even know if it's actually there. My final question is, um, you were working on the new book for 10 years? 12 years. 12 yeah. years. Are you working on another book? And you don't have to give us any plot. Yeah, I'm actually working on um, a math novel. So it's supposed to be something that will uh, be accessible to non-mathematicians and still have a narrative plot and everything. And what I'm also doing, you know, you've been looking at the screen a lot with the animations. I'm taking uh, this, this, ex this sort of little uh, PowerPoint pieces as video, and I'm going to embed them into the book, especially as e-books. You'll be able to click on those and actually see them. Oh, that, that's fascinating. Oh, thank you. Um, so I had a good question. And they, they, with Bluesheimers, they just kind of drift all over the place. But we wish you a lot of success with the city of DV. Thank you. Um, I think you will have it. I'm glad you're branching off into another area. Mm -hmm. Right. Just try, try exercising different muscles. Uh, you know, it's more fun that way. And when you think about it, this is a trilogy that's spanning 13, 14 years? It's uh, 17, 18 years of my life, one third of my life. So that's what it's been spent uh, for this trilogy. But it's it is a trilogy, right? It, it is sort of a loose trilogy. You don't loose. need to um, read any of them in yeah. order. Uh, it's basically about Bombay or Mumbai. It's past, present, and future. So this is the future part. Manil Siri, do you have a website? I do, manilsuri.com. And what's the Facebook? Facebook is, you know, you just do Google with my name and Facebook and you'll, you'll get up with it. Thanks for showing up and I hope you show up before the next five years elapse. Okay, thank you. I'm glad you like our studio. I want to thank Jill Pearson, our director. I want to thank Dave Gauthier. Judy Kellerman's been absolutely essential to us. Uh, Jenny Bride, it's so good to see you again. And Anthony Gamari and everyone here at WinCam, thank you very much for helping us put together February 20th, 2013, February 20th, 2013's interview with Manel Suri. Thanks again. Thank you.
But now you're giving the fans a chance to meet you face to face. That's a whole new thing. Um, you know, when, when we do records, uh, we do in stores, mm -hmm. the record stores where you get the CDs and shaking hands and meeting people at the, you know, which is very similar to this. Yeah. It's really similar. So that's not new to me. I've been doing that for a while. It's a lot of fun. But the book is different. It's a whole different world it's sometimes. Different, different people, yeah. You get, I mean, you get, you know, some of your, your hardcore, you know, rock fans here, but then you get all those book people in there too, which they don't come to a normal record store, in store, so it's a nice, nice combination. I know you're busy. We're not going to take up too much of your time. Where's the tour taking? Um, Okay, uh, tomorrow we go to Nebraska because I'm working on a new show for NBC. Uh, so that doesn't have anything to do with the book. Then we go to Chicago. Um, we go to Toronto. We go back to New York. Uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco. And I think I'm, I think I'm you know, done doing the book tour. It really is like working behind a record. Yeah, I know. I feel like I'm on tour. Wow. Well, it's Friday night in Boston. The Red Sox have won and you're here. Yes. And I just hope you have a great time here in Boston because Thank you. We've been watching you for many years. The Aussie tour. That's cool. I think I interviewed you back then in eighty four or something. Probably you probably did. Central <laughs> Worcester Central. There you go. Oh yeah. Wanna grab a couple of autographs and thanks so much for me. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Right on. Oh, no, they might be up there. Please. No. Oh, no. We'll grab one. The rehearsal space. Is it in the best of the rehearsal space? Yeah. Okay, cool. Hey, what's up? This is Tommy Lee uh, with Matt O'Connor presenting the best of the rehearsal space.